Thank you again for joining us for our Sunday online worship service. Before we get started today, I just want to send a special thank you to Joy, to Bailey, to all that have helped lead us in worship over these last several weeks. I know the difficulty of only being in front of a camera and not being around people, in front of people, and, and doing these things, uh, leading worship, preaching, uh, doing the Wednesday online worship. All of these are different and they're a unique challenge that many people are facing in this time. And Mount Zion, I want you to know that we are blessed because we have several leaders that have stepped up and they have went not only above, but they have went out, outside of their comfort zone to do things that they probably never envisioned themselves doing. Whether it's Kristen, Mandy, uh, Haley over in the children's area and several others, Mike, uh, one of our life group leaders, uh, Susan McClear leading our Wednesday women's prayer time, and, and several others. Forgive me if I left you out, 
but there have been several people that have stepped up and it could be a Zoom uh, prayer meeting on a Wednesday evening. It could be a life group lesson on a Sunday morning via conference call or however we're doing it. But we've had several people step up and I'm grateful. And from the bottom of my heart, I want to say thank you for stepping up and stepping out of your comfort zone and, and going on this journey with me. This week, we sent out an update, an update for our immediate plans uh, concerning uh, the quarantine and when we're going to be off of lockdown and when we're allowed to meet back in person together. I have met with our transitions team. I've met with our chairman of deacons. I've met with our staff. And what we have decided to do is we're going to only have online worship, Wednesday online uh, worship until May the 17th. And when that Sunday arises and, and gets here, we will look at things, reassess the situation and see how uh, everything is going, how the reopening of the state of Georgia is going. And at that time, we're going to make what we think, uh, relying fully on God and trusting the Holy Spirit, what we think is the wisest, safest decision for us as a church. And I want to thank you for your continued support during this time. You are vital to the ministry of Mount Zion Baptist Church, and uh, I'm eagerly and excitedly <laughs> looking forward to the day that we can meet back in person again. So with that being said, I would like to open us up in prayer this morning, and we're going to dig right into God's Word. Father God, thank you. God, thank you that you love us. God, thank you that you loved us so much, as Scripture says, yet when we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God, thank you for the gift of salvation. Thank you for the obedience of Jesus to go to that cross and to die for all the sins of humanity. God, thank you for having the plan of restoration through your Son. And God, I thank you that we can trust you that we can know you never, um, you never leave us, you never forsake us. God, you never turn your back on us, you never turn away from us. You're always waiting right there for us with open arms for us to turn from the things of this world, God, to repent and to run into your open arms. And God, I thank you for our church. God, I thank you for leaders that have stepped up and are leading from the front, that are getting out of their comfort zones, God, and are leading people to the cross that every week I see different people um, doing things and teaching things that are helping people grow in their relationship with you. And I'm very grateful. I'm very humbled and um, just thankful, God, for people like that in our church. And God, I pray that you'll continue to provide. God, you have so graciously provided for us up until this point. And God, we trust and um, know that you will continue to do that. And I pray that we're able to, um, to see that and that our words, that our actions, that our lives reflect all that you have done for us, that everyone that comes into contact with Mount Zion Baptist Church feels as though they have been loved, cared for, and God just uh, placed above any of us. And God, teach us how to esteem others higher. God, teach us how to love people. And God, teach us how to get out into our community and to share the gospel of Jesus with anyone that we come in contact with. God, we love you, we praise you, and I pray that today our worship service, our time in the Word, and us just being together, um, God, that it brings you honor, that it brings you glory, and I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So this week, we're going to continue to look at the study that we started uh, two or three weeks ago, the cast of Acts, back to the beginning, taking a look into the lives of people that were very influential, that had a big role in the creation and the beginning of the early church when Jesus ascended into heaven. So far, we've looked briefly into the life of Peter. And Peter, we saw how Peter, being inspired by the Holy Spirit, was able to help God's people, help the people that were in Jerusalem during this time to understand what went on that day at Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came down and people were speaking in all these different ways and able to understand. Scripture tells us that through Peter's boldness, and through him being obedient to what the Holy Spirit was directing him to do, that many people turned and they trusted in the Lord on that day. The scripture says in Acts 2 verse 41, those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to that number, uh, to their number that day. What, what a great testimony and just an awesome example of if you're bold and you're confident in Jesus's name, there's no telling the doors that God will throw open. And 3,000 people, it says, in one day were added to the, the church in Jerusalem. Last week, we, we took a look at Barnabas and what a cool guy Barnabas was. Through him, we learned how important it is to have that kingdom mindset, 
Everything Barnabas did was focused on the kingdom of God and how could he expand it? How could he do his part to share it? We learned how to be a good friend as him and Paul were friends together, went on missionary trips together, did many things together, lived life together. And then we also learned at the end of our study on Barnabas, when him and Paul had a disagreement and felt that one should, they should take one person and one felt they should take the other person, we saw that Barnabas was able to trust the godly discernment as he followed the direction that God, he felt, was leading his life. And that was what I, we, we wanted to learn through that, that we want to trust the direction that God is leading our life. We want to know it doesn't matter what people may say or what thoughts they may have. If we feel that God is leading us a certain direction, then only God, the Holy Spirit, and, and we know that. And so we want to have boldness like Barnabas and say, this is the direction I want to go. Now, the cast members that we're going to look at today are Ananias and Sapphira. And it's a very familiar story, a familiar part of scripture of Ananias and Sapphira uh, that many people will know, and they've read it many times. But I think it's not only important for us to look at the act that Ananias and Sapphira did, what they actually did, but it's, it's important for us to look at the root of what caused them to do this, to have a discussion beforehand of this is what we're gonna do, to actually go do it, and then in front of other people, uh, just stick with their story and say, yes, this is the truth. Um, so we're going to be in Acts chapter 5. If you would like to follow along with us this morning, Acts chapter 5, I'm going to read verses 1 through 11, and then we'll look at it and see what, what are we trying to learn from it in 2020. It says, now a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself that brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. And then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied just to human beings, but to God. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died, and great fear seized all who heard what had happened. And then some young men came forward, wrapped up his body, and carried him out and buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Peter asked her, tell me, is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? Yes, she said, that is the price. And Peter said to her, how could you conspire to test the Lord of the spirit of the Lord? Listen, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out also. At that moment, she fell down at his feet and died. Then the young men came in, and finding her dead, carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. Now, following in the footsteps of what Barnabas just did, uh, Ananias and Sapphira, they wanted to show their obedience to the Lord. They also wanted to show the respect that they had for the apostles because it says they placed this money uh, at, in front of the apostles, at, just like Barnabas did at the apostles' feet. Remember last week in Acts chapter 4, verse 36 and 37, it said, Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. The action that Barnabas took by taking this money from this land sale and laying it at the feet of the apostles, it obviously had an effect on Ananias and Sapphira. But you see the difference in these two different separate actions, the one that Barnabas took and laid at the feet of the apostles, and then Ananias and his wife bringing this offering. Ananias and Sapphira did not necessarily bring their offering from the humble, selfless place that Barnabas did. We see that because in verse 3, we see Peter asking Ananias and Sapphira this question. He says, how is it that Satan has filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? You see, Ananias and Sapphira had allowed pride to creep into their lives, had allowed pride to creep into their home. They had allowed Satan to cause them to want to feel that the, the apostles, that all the people in attendance were impressed with their offering, would think that they had done something that was really good 
for the kingdom of God. And so the first point I want to make today is, is pride will blur our vision. Isaiah chapter 2 verse 12 says, The Lord Almighty has a day in store for all the proud and lofty, for all that is exalted, and they will be humbled. We also know in Philippians 2, 3, the scripture that says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. You, Satan allowed pride to creep into this decision that Ananias and Sapphira had made. Not giving the proper amount for the land sale was something that they as a couple had previously discussed and went before Peter and the other apostles and actually took the action. They convinced themselves that the approval of the apostles, that the accolades that they would receive from the onlookers, they, they had convinced themselves that all of that was more important than doing what was right before God. Peter relying on the Holy Spirit, because let's just be honest, how else would he have known to ask this question if the Holy Spirit did not direct him? We, we all have probably have people in our lives that have asked us a question and we're like, hey, how'd you know that? And sometimes it's the Holy Spirit, sometimes it's other ways. But in this instant, we know that Peter was inspired by the Holy Spirit and he asked him this question, what made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied just to human beings, but to God. Now, many of us, we will allow uh, pride to blur our vision. We allow, we, we allow the praise of people uh, to distort the way we look at God and the way we see his holiness, but also we allow pride and the assurance from others and the praise from others to distort our vision on God's judgment. Because scripture says in Psalm 11, uh, 7, 11, that God is a righteous judge. God is a righteous judge. So yes, God is loving. Yes, God is caring. Yes, he is kind. He's compassionate. He's merciful. He is all of these things. Everything that makes up the DNA of God are all those things. But we also have to realize that God will also righteously judge humanity. If our own lives are not living up to the standards that God has set before us, then each one of us can expect those decisions, those actions that we're taking to, to be a part of God righteously judging our lives. Not in a way that, that belittles you, not in a way that humiliates you, but in a way that God is so gracious to do, in a way that draws our attention and draws our focus back to the main thing. And that main thing being, living lives that are honoring and pleasing to the Lord. You see, Ananias and Sapphira had allowed their pride to blur their vision and to make their decision that they were both obviously heavily judged on. The second thing we see, not only does pride blur our vision, but pride brings death. In Ananias and Sapphira's lives, uh, pride actually brought physical death. In verse five, it says, when Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. And in verse 10, we go down and we read about Sapphira. It says at that moment, she fell down at his feet and died. We know from Proverbs 16, 18, it says pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. In our lives, pride may not bring physical death. Now, as a man, as a guy, as a younger guy, not anymore, as a younger guy beforehand, uh, we may allow ourselves to be tempted and to put into situations where physical death, because we want to be prideful and seem tough and not look like um, weak in front of our friends. Now, that may put us in harm's way and our lives may be lost. But many times pride doesn't put us in harm's way. Pride puts us in a position to where we don't die of a physical death, but we do have the chance to die a spiritual death one in which we feel totally distant from God, one in which we have esteemed our, ourselves so high above other people that we've literally lost contact with reality and, and where we are in this world. You see, as a believer, we believe that your salvation cannot be lost. There's nothing you can do from the moment that you, it says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And from that moment forward, if you truly believe that in your heart, then you're saved and there's nothing you can do to lose that. But what you can lose 
you can lose the nearness and the closeness that God's relationship brings into your life. You can lose that. As Christians, we are all called to live lives that are selfless. We've, we've talked about it a lot lately, and we've, we've been instructed to place others above our own. We can't let our pride work its way into the depths of our soul. We cannot let our pride make us feel as though we are higher than other people and destroy that relationship that God brought to us through his son, Jesus. We can't let our pride get in the way. C.S. Lewis says this. He says, a proud man is always looking down on things and people. And of course, as long as you are looking down, you cannot see something that is above you. We always want to have our eyes fixed on above. We always want to have our gaze above on God and things of God. If we're looking down at people, if we're looking down on others, then it is literally impossible for us to have our gaze fixed upon God. Ananias and Sapphira, prime examples of people who had witnessed mighty, mighty things of God, and they still allowed Satan to impact their life because surely they had to witness things that Jesus had done and been a part of while he was here on earth. They had to have heard of the miracles that he performed. In some instances, maybe they were there when some of these things happened and they were eyewitnesses to a miracle or to a healing or to something that Jesus said, uh, an action he took. Who knows, but they were there and saw it because they're part of this early church. So they were obviously around. But the opportunity, the opportunity to have that spotlight taken off of Christ, taken off of God and placed directly on them was something that they had, they allowed to creep into their, into their life. They wanted that spotlight to be on them. They let it overshadow everything that they had seen God do and they had witnessed uh, Jesus do while he was here on earth. Have you ever been there? Have you ever walked down that road? Have you ever witnessed God do something so amazing in your life or in the life of someone around you? And, and it was just something that if God didn't step in and do it, then the situation was not going to be rectified. What we want to do, Mount Zion, is we want to let that be our witness. We want to let that be the memories that we keep in our heart, in our, in our minds, to fuel us, to remember the things that God has done, to desire uh, not to be a prideful person. Do not look for praise of other people, but just remember all the mighty things that God has done in your personal life and the life of people around you, and let that be what we go out and show to people. Not to ever bring the glorification to ourselves, not to ever esteem ourselves up, but to just walk humbly in obedience to what God has called us to do because of the sacrifice of his son. In Matthew, in chapter 6, in verses 1 through 4, it says, Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others, to be seen by them. If you do so, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret. And then it ends like this. It says, then your father who sees what has been done in secret will reward you. And so we don't need to be out uh, on the street corners yelling as loud as we can. We don't need to be the loudest person in the room. We don't need the person that makes the most, uh, puts out the most tweets or the most Facebook posts or Instagram posts trying to bring attention to ourselves. It says that if you want to help someone, if you want to go give to the needy, if you want to go witness to someone, don't broadcast it. Just do it uh, quietly. It says, because what you do in secret, your father sees. And what your father sees, it says he will reward you for it. Ananias and Sapphira can be labeled as hypocritical. They can be labeled as hypocrites. By being members of this early group of believers, you know that they knew the truths about God. You know that they had witnessed things that Christ had done, and they were expected to have a higher moral standard. But obviously in this situation, they did not. To a certain extent, I think you will agree with me, I hope, 
that I think we can all be hypocritical at times, considering the fact that every one of us are born with a sinful nature. Our actions may not always meet up with the moral standards that we know of God, that are of God, and that we believe and that many of us proclaim on a weekly, if not multiple times a week basis. And so some of us, many of us may be labeled hypocritical at times. And what I'm challenging us with today, as well as myself, is to stay focused on God's plans. Stay focused on God's will for our lives. Do not be influenced by the praise of others, but to just stay completely surrendered, to live in a life that reflects everything that we read in these scriptures, to live lives that are not hypocritical, but to live lives that are pleasing and honoring to God. And the, the number one thing here is it all starts with Christ. It all starts with that relationship with Jesus because we cannot do it on our own. We can try as hard as we can. We can be the nicest person we wanna be. We can do as many uh, things, of acts of service that we can count, that can take up all of our hours in a day. And if we don't have that relationship with Christ, then it's all done in void. So if you don't have that relationship with Christ, then I pray that today will be the day. Don't wait another day to get your relationship right with the one that surrendered all of it for you. I promise you this, you will not regret that decision. There may be days where it's hard and there may be days where you feel like I cannot live up to this commitment that I've made in Christ. But I promise you there will not be a day that goes by that you're not thankful, that you're not humbled by the love and the grace and the mercy shown by God through his son, Jesus. I pray that we're able to look at this decision that Ananias and Sapphira made and to learn from their mistakes, right? Isn't that the goal in life, to learn from your mistakes? You don't want to repeat the same mistakes over. So we want to learn from their mistake. We want to learn how to humble ourselves. We want to learn how to not let pride to creep into us and distract us from the mission that God has placed us on. And the mission that God has placed us on is very simple. Scripture says, to go therefore and make disciples, to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so if we're focused on God's plan, if we're focused on that loving relationship that God has through his son Jesus to every one of us, then we can stay focused on his will and we won't let pride and other things creep into our soul. I pray that Mount Zion, we will be known for being a church of selfless believers that we're always willing to sacrifice for others, to esteem others higher than ourselves. Mount Zion, this week, my challenge for you is put into practice the things that we read in scripture. Do not let yourself be labeled hypocritical or a hypocrite. Reflect the love of Christ to everyone that you come into contact with. And so that we will be known as the church on the corner that loves God, that loves people, and we want to live it out every day of our lives. Let's pray together. Father God, thank you. God, thank you that your word is true. God, thank you that we can invest our lives into your word and it never changes. God, we thank you for the stories that you um, kept in this word. God, that you allowed men to write down, that you preserved so that, God, we can see in 2020 how pride can be so destructive, how we can get in, and if we, if we lift ourselves up, God, if our eyes are not transfixed on you, then we can so quickly get off track. And so, God, I pray for each one of us today, you will realign our hearts, God, you will realign our eyes to be focused on the things that you'll have us be focused on, and that, God, everyone that comes into contact with us will not see us as a group of hypocrites, that will see us as humble, sinful people that have been saved by the grace and mercy of Christ, trying every day to grow closer to you, trying every day to walk in obedience, relying 100% on the Holy Spirit and the direction that comes from you, God, through Christ and through the Holy Spirit. So God, I pray for us as a church, God, that you will teach us, that you will continue to provide for us, and God, that we in return can reflect your love and mercy and grace to everyone that you put in our past. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Now, Zion, have a blessed week, and I look forward to seeing you again very soon.